I am Kate Hampton. I work at the State Historic Preservation Office, which is part of the Montana Historical Society. We're actually located in a lovely 1970s quadruplex down on 8th Avenue that will never be eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. But that's from which we, we work and we identify special and significant places all across the state. So I really have probably the best job ever because I get to um, engage with people that always have wonderful, wonderful stories. And I learned about the Beacons um, by engaging with people that have wonderful, wonderful stories like Pat. Um, I was over at the Montana Pilots Association giving a different talk about B-17s and um, somebody came up to me afterward and said, do you know about the Beacons? And I said, no. So um, from there I got kind of obsessed and have taken a lot of information from very, very generous people. Um, so I do acknowledge that a lot of this comes from people who worked on this before me and a lot of you remember these and fly by them and if you have more information to add or if I get something wrong, please let me know so that I can uh, correct it. This is the first time I've given this talk, so be patient and I hope you enjoy it. And of course everybody knows where this one is, right? McDonald Pass, that's right which is the first one that I ever saw up close and in person. And um, actually, thank goodness, it was such a beautiful week this week because I realized I didn't have nearly enough photographs to go along with my long-winded talk. Um, so I got to run up there and take a few photos. I did not take this one, however. I am not that talented. Uh, this is by a gentleman named Jason Savage, who's a professional photographer in town who generously let me use the, the photo. So we thank him. And I thought I'd start a little bit with a little fun aviation in Montana history. And the first one I came up with was I heard about a gentleman named Oscar Hunt, who was billed as the greatest living aeronautic wonder of the age. Uh, he thrilled the crowd here at the state, Montana State Fair here in Helena when he uh, descended from his giant balloon by parachute from which he performed aerobatic tricks. As reported in the Helena newspaper, Professor Oscar Hunt is now sailing at a dizzying height over the city, constantly performing astonishing evolutions to the delight of the multitude. He must have been fantastic because he had quite the career. He showed up at county and, and state fairs all over the country, and by the 18, uh, late 1800s, he had people with him, um, and they would do kind of aerobatic tricks and, and men and, and ladies would do it. And so I have a few of the, the stunt artists um, that could be hired by your county fair in order to have him perform. So that's one of the first aeronautic wonders of the state. Um, the next that I wanted to talk about was about 50 years later when an absorky farmer named Charles Chalky Benbow had an idea. And here's coincidence for you. I was learning a little bit about Mr. Bembo and heard that when he was 17, he ran away from home, uh, and his home was in Colorado Springs, and he ran away to North Park, Colorado, which is where my father-in-law grew up. So I was talking to him, and I said, did you ever know a guy named Bembo? And he's like, no, I don't know that name. But he pulled open his History of North Park book, and said, oh, he was married to my cousin. And we went through the whole litany of stuff, so it's just amazing how closely related everybody in the world really is. But Mr. Bemba was uh, quite the inventor. Um, he actually established a patent for a railroad pin, um, which was the beginning of his very sad kind of life in that nothing seemed to work out for this poor guy. Um, he invented a railroad pin and went to patent it, and he was two weeks late. Somebody else beat him to the patent and made a ton of money off of this railroad pin. So then he turned to um, flight, and he designed this wonderful machine called the Montana Meteor. Um, he began drawing the plans in 1901 and uh, secure, and he tried to get investors. He got a big investing group around in Red Lodge by 1902. And he really wanted to enter the aerial races at the St. Louis Exposition in 1904. Um, so he hoped to win the $100,000 prize. And trial runs were successful. He was getting national press. But on the final day um, 
of the races, the wind rose up just as he was going up, and the meteor was caught in a number of power lines all around, uh, and he was disqualified from the race. <laughs> so poor Mr. Bimbo. And uh, then he went back. He, he had a farm in Absorky, and he was tooling around out there and found some chrome out in the hills and got a partner, and they thought they would develop this mine. And around 1920, they got an offer for $900,000 for their claims. And his partner talked him out of it, said, no, we can develop them ourselves. We're going to make a ton of money. And of course, they never did. He died in 1937. And in 1950, his partner sold to the Anaconda Mining Company for $50 million. <laughs> So poor Mr. Bembo, he actually, and he owned a bar for a short time in Absorky, um, but his wife, which apparently was his only joy in life, but his wife made him sell it because it was unseemly. So I feel bad for poor old Chalky Bembo. Um, but he had this great contraption um, as early as 1904. Um, so the first recorded flight of an airplane in Montana took place at, here at Helena, the state fairgrounds, on September 26, 1910. Pilot J.C. Bud Mars made two successful flights that day in his Curtis airplane, named the Skylark. And of course, we know about Cromwell Dixon. Sweet Cromwell um, made his famous flight across the Continental Divide on September 30th, 1911. When he was just 14 years old, Dixon had built a sky bicycle powered by pedals and a propeller and steered with a rudder. Um, and lifted by a giant silk balloon, sort of like Mr. Bembo's contraption. Five years later, he begged and begged and begged his mother, and she finally relented and let him um, apply to the Curtis Exhibition Company to be an exhibition pilot. Um, so then he was 19, so he scurried and he got his pilot's license on August 31st, 1911, and at 19 became the youngest licensed pilot in the world. And just a month later, again on September 30th, he set off on his famous flight over the divide, hoping to win the $10,000 prize that was put up by the local uh, chambers of commerce in the city. So he got up in his airplane, he took off, excited spectators gathered at the fairgrounds, and several p people had already built a fire on the other side of the divide, waiting to help guide him in. And he found his landing spot. Um, it was a beautiful, clear, windless day and they watched him spiral up to 7,000 feet and soar out of sight. And of course, he managed to, to land over in Blossburg, which is on the just siding along the line just over Mullen Pass, or not Mullen Pass, the pass, um, and flew back. The whole thing took about two hours. So he did win his prize money, and just four days, a few days later, on October 2nd, 1911, while performing his usual aerial stunts at the Spokane Fair, um, Cromwell's black biplane got caught by a strong wind. Oops. There he is, flying over the Rockies. Um, and he crashed to his death just a few days later at 19 years old. So poor Cromwell. Um, and of course, if you go up to the McDonald Pass now, it's Cromwell Dixon Campground and all that celebration. Um, so that was 1911. We had a couple of wonderful aviatrixes early on, too. Um, one was Catherine Stimson, who was billed the flying schoolgirl. She became the first person to deliver airmail in Montana. She flew it between the fairgrounds and a little spot up here uh, so she could walk it to the post office here in downtown Helena. So that was the first airmail delivered in Montana. And they had these exhibition pilots all over the country kind of getting people excited about the concept of airmail, which was a very new technology at the time. Yes, and her sister was also an aviatrix and, and a flight instructor. That's right. They were a great family. Um, she actually worked and um, through World War I, and she caught the, the flu in the early 1920s, and that prevented her from flying again. So, um, but her family was a great, great famous family. Um, so one of the earliest airfields uh, in Montana was in Miles City, established in 1920 by Earl Vance and A.W. Stevenson. Both were aviation pioneers in Montana. Earl Vance studied at Aberdeen Business School and graduated in 1916. 
And in 1917, he entered the Army, enrolling in the flight training school, and he loved it so much he made it his career. From 1919 till 39, he was engaged in a variety of flying occupations, including barnstorming, running his own flying service, working as a commercial pilot for the National Park Airways, and doing aerial mapping for the U.S. government. But who I really am fascinated with is his wife. Um, Esther Combs Vance was the first woman licensed to fly airplanes in Montana. And there is a little bit of uh, question about that. Some other people claim to be it, but I'm going to go with Esther because she's so cool. Um, so she is great. She was born in 1903, um, and then the family moved to Sydney, and she graduated from high school there. Um, and in August 25, she married Earl Vance. And in 28, she became the first licensed first as a private pilot and then as a limited commercial pilot and worked as the business manager and treasurer for Vance Air um, until Earl's death in 1944. And um, after her death, she moved to Missoula and worked at the university as in the registrar's office for years and years. Uh, so she met up with a lot of students, but a um, little lesser known, but really a pioneer in Montana aviation and in Montana history, I think. So another early airport, of course, was Hale Field in Missoula, which is where Sentinel High School now stands. And I just really like this shot. And I know this is much later, and I'm going to jump back, don't worry, but I just thought this was a fantastic picture and I wanted to include it. Um, because don't they look elegant? I just want to dress up to go on an airplane these days. You know, I usually dress my kids in pajamas and give them a pillow and hope that they'll sleep through the flight and think, we should make it an occasion because it really is incredible that we can fly through the air. And so they really made an occasion of it here. Um, this is a shot from 1936 uh, talking about Northwest Airlines when they began regular service in Montana. Um, and this is a shot from the Hale Field in Missoula. But we'll jump back a little bit. Before regular commercial passenger service began in Montana and, else, and even elsewhere in the U.S., Many recognized the potential of the fledgling aviation industry, and no one embraced it more than the Postal Service. Earl Ovington made the first post office department authorized mail flight in a plane on September 23, 1911, at an aviation meeting on Long Island, New York. And um, he made daily flights between Garden City Estates and Mineola. And instead of landing the plane, he didn't bother to land the plane in Mineola. He just dropped the bags from the airplane, and the postmaster collected them and, and delivered them. Because they had the most training, and in the hope of training other pilots, um, the Army had control of the airmail service when it began a regular route in 1918. In this picture, Major Reuben Fleet stands in front of his Cur Curtis JN4H Jenny airplane after flying from Philadelphia to Potomac Park in Washington, D.C. on May 15, 1918, the date regularly scheduled air ma mail began service between Washington and New York City. In the photograph, I love this, you can still see Fleet's map still strapped to his leg. You see it there? Can you imagine how difficult is that to have to fiddle with a map while you're trying to fly this, these things? I guess you still do. I will do this caveat. I am not a pilot. I can't even drive a stick shift car, so I don't think I will ever be a pilot. Um, so I'm just so fascinated and impressed by people who can do it. Um, this guy looks happy, and I wanted to include this picture because he's got his little sister standing there congratulating him. He did the second leg of that New York to Washington, D.C. flight on May 15th. Um, and his sister gave him a bunch of roses when they landed, so I thought that was fun. This is Lieutenant Edgerton, and he went on to be a big player in the early airmail days of the post office. So a lot of people did a lot of very successful things um, that day on May 15th, and it was a big deal. So when they wanted to do the reverse flight from Washington, D.C. up to New York, they um, had everybody there. President Woodrow Wilson was there, and I was going to pull up a... I have a sh silent movie showing uh, President Wilson, but I think it's going to be too much of a distraction for me to try and figure <laughs> that out. It's just a little silent clip where you see President Wilson congratulating this very handsome and cocky-looking pilot. Um, and that pilot's name was um, 
what was his name, George Boyle. And George got the job. He was a brand new pilot. He had just gotten his license, but he was the, bro or the son in law of the commerce director. So <laughs> he got the plum job of flying. And it's actually kind of a hysterical but sad story. Um, he was newly licensed. And he was there, and he climbed into his airplane and called for them to spin the propeller in this grand kind of flashy way, and nothing happened. And they tried it again, and nothing happened. They couldn't get the darn plane to start. So people are pouring all over it, trying to figure out what mechanics were wrong. Nobody had put gas in the airplane. <laughs> so they loaded it up with gas, and they got everything in, and he finally took off. And, you know, it's a pretty straightforward flight from D.C. to Philadelphia. I grew up in Baltimore, so, you know, it's, it's right there. Well, instead of turning north, he turned south and flew around and around and couldn't figure out where he was supposed to be and then crash-landed 25 miles away in Waldorf, Maryland. So that was rather unsuccessful and embarrassing, but they actually gave him a second try um, a couple of days later, and he loaded up his airplane, and they even escorted him out and said, okay, go this way. And the other pilot went away, and he, he was told just to follow the Chesapeake Bay, which, of course, bisects Maryland there. And he did. Unfortunately, he followed it all the way around the loop at the north end and kept going south and ended up crash landing out of gas again in Virginia. <laughs> so poor Mr. Boyle, who, um, you know, looks all happy here, and he's looking very serious talking to President Woodrow Wilson over there, like, yes, I can do it. And um, those two flights pretty much ended his career in the Air Mail Service, so he was not invited back after that. It's a fuzzy map. I, I apologize for the quality of this particular um, picture, but I wanted to give you an idea of how difficult this was, actually. There were no aeronautical charts. Nobody had been up there before to take aerial photos. You don't really know where you're going, and you have to really concentrate on landmarks, be it mountains, rivers, railroads, whatever basically follows what path you want to go to. <coughs> and so a lot of times, they would draw out their maps. And this is actually um, Section 5 across Philadelphia. You can see, if you can see, it's fuzzy, but it's this is the Susquehanna River, you know, here's a railway, here are some mountains, so they kind of know where they're going. And, you know, in 1918 through about 1920, this is very upsetting, and, and they need to know uh, where they go. They depend on them, and this means they can only fly in daylight hours, right? Because they have to be able to see where they're going. And airplanes that carried mail had to land and transfer their cargo to trains by nightfall. And the process was inconvenient, to say the least, laborious and expensive. Um, and Congress would have none of it. And so they, w they needed to come up with an alternative. They needed to come up with a way that they could fly by night so that air mail could survive and Congress wouldn't cut all funding to it. Um, and the postmaster was obsessed. He would send pilots up in the worst possible conditions because, you know, neither rain nor sleet nor gloom of night, right? And uh, he was absolutely determined. Um, so the experiment continues, um, and they were determined to show that it could be practical. But Congress decided that they were only going to fund a truly transcontinental route um, from New York to San Francisco. And that's the way they wanted to go. The first legs from New York to Cleveland with a stop in Bellefont, uh, Pennsylvania. And actually one of the most dangerous up to this date parts of the trip were the crossing the Alleghenies um, between the cent central Pennsylvania and over to Cleveland. Many, many pilots did not make it or turned back or crash landed. Um, so that was a really tough, even just getting it to Chicago uh, was, was terrible in these first years. Um, but they were determined to do it, and then they went to Chicago with a stop in Bryan, Ohio, and that opened in 1919. And the third leg opened in 1920 from Chicago to Omaha via I Iowa City. And then the last segment from Omaha to San Francisco went through North Platte, Nebraska, Cheyenne, Rollins, and Rock Springs in Wyoming, um, and over to Salt Lake City, Utah, Elko, Reno, 
um, and then on to San Francisco, and that opened on September 8, 1920. The routes, even by day, were very dangerous, and one gentleman said to our friend Edgerton, who was on that early flight, um, said that the Cheyenne to Salt Lake City route was a, quote, a good one to kill the men you seem to have a grudge against or want to see out of the way. So it was not fun. But they decided that they were going to try this by night on February 22, 1921. The Postmaster General really wanted it because that's in the beginning of March was when Congress was going to vote whether or not the money, they had the money. So they decided to do it in the middle of winter. So wretched weather halted the westbound mail, mail airplanes at Dubois, Pennsylvania, and Chicago. So we had two flights going from east to west and to another two flights coming west to east to try and make this transcontinental flight. Um, and so the two coming out of the east didn't make it past Chicago, so they failed right on that February night. Um, on the west side, it was even worse. Uh, the pilot of one airplane, William Lewis, was killed when his airplane stalled out after takeoff in Elko, Nevada. And the second eastbound plane continued with its mail and mail from Lewis's airplane. Um, and the mail base made it as far as Omaha, Nebraska in the early morning of February 23rd. By the time the mail reached that city, it was cold. It was the middle of the night. And the pilots knew from the weather reports that the weather east was even worse. The airmail service desperately needed a hero, and they found it in a man named Jack Knight. Isn't he roguish and handsome and wonderful? We like him. Um, he took over multiple legs. He took over when nobody else would fly. Um, and he braved fog and snow and finally landed in Chicago, all with a broken nose that he had suffered the week before when his plane crashed trying to do an airmail route in similar conditions. Um, so there he was. But they did it, and he had a hero, and they, they got their money, which was really important. But they took it away again right away, as Congress is wont to do. So the post office really had to figure out what, how they were going to fund this, because they needed to prove that it was a worthwhile investment. Um, and so they went to private companies, and they got investors to come and help them uh, prove that this was possible. Um, and then they began to construct this lighted airway system. When Jack Knight did it, they had arranged with farmers to burn bonfires in the fields to try and help him guide the path, and they realized that they couldn't count on the kindness of strangers for much longer, and they needed to come up with a design and a beacon system. So they actually turned to the lighthouse service, of course, right? Because what are they but terrestrial lighthouses? And the pilots, especially in World War I, had great experience or really counted on the lighthouses along the coast to guide them. Um, so they wanted to come up with designs, and these are some of the earlier designs that the lighthouse service uh, put into put into play. So they were relatively successful, and they managed to perfect the system a little bit more. And Congress says, "Okay, yeah, we'll t we'll take that." And by 1926, they decided to pass the Air Commerce Act, and this legislation created the Airways Division within the Bureau of Lighthouses. Um, and then all these federal agencies: the Army was interested, the Post Office was interested. Um, and they asked the Lighthouse Division to help design the lights and standardize them. And they installed the first air light, airway light beacon in Moline, Illinois, the kind of this first standardized version in 1926. But by 1933, they had created 18,000 miles of airways with 1,550 beacons and 263 intermediate landing fields. Um, just a few years later. The Federal Aviation Administration eventually took over control of the airway beacon system. And here is what the standard beacon looks like. It was 51 feet tall, but it could be higher or lower. It could go up to 90 feet. It could be down as, as low as 12 feet. Um, and it was mounted on top was a rotating beacon using a 110 volt, 1,000 watt lamp in front of a 24-inch parabolic mirror. And these things were so powerful. They rotated six times a minute. And on a clear night, you could see it from 40 miles away. 
Inside the drum was an automatic light changer. So if one burnt out, if one lamp burnt out, it would actually drop down and another one would come up within a half a second, which is just incredible. Um, and similarly, there were these generator sheds right next door. And the generator sheds often had two generators on them. They were run by, first, terrifyingly enough, white gas, um, and then uh, propane, um, and kind of all of these different liquid fuels. They'd have these enormous drums of fuels that would run these things. It's a miracle that they weren't just blowing up <laughs> all over the place. But these generators, there would be one or two of them, and they would simultaneously try and switch on, and they'd go back and forth and back and forth until one started. Um, and this happened every single night. Um, so we have the generator shed, and then there was an arrow at the other end. First, they were painted black with yellow border, and, now, and then they standardized them a little bit more. And um, they pointed the direction to the next beacon. And if you couldn't see it at night, it was actually a very good by-day guide as well. Um, so we have these guys kind of all over. On the top, there was a code so you know where you were and which beacon you were at. Um, and two fixed course lights would be mounted up there by the rotating beacon. Of course, they didn't rotate. They showed the path. And they were in different colors. If it was red, it was just a beacon without a landing field. If it was green, there was an emergency landing field there. Um, so you kind of knew where you were staying and, and how well you were doing. Um, the sheds were about 20 by 14 um, and placed on a concrete slab. And the airway code and beacon number was painted on the roof. The number derived from the beacon's distance from the terminal point. OK, so for example, this sample is from the Denver to Kansas City Airway, which I know isn't in Montana, but this was the best sketch I could find. <laughs> so forgive that. So the D is for Denver, the hyphen and KC is for Kansas City, so you know what airway you're on. And then the 41 um, meant that it was about 410 miles from Denver, from the starting point. Or no, I got that mixed up. No, from Denver. That's right. So they would, the number was derived from the hundreds, right? So 410, you just drop the unit digit, and you kind of knew how far along you were going. Um, so that's the code. Um, in Montana, a very small number of local airlines were present in the 1920s. And plans for regular air service were being made in Great Falls, Miles City, Billings, Helena, and Butte. One of the small airlines serving this area was the National Parks Airlines. Um, founded in 1927 and 28, its planes shuttled between Salt Lake, Great Falls, and Glacier Park with stops in Dillon, Butte, and Helena. In 1928, National Parks became the first scheduled airline in Montana to receive an airmail contract. Frank Wiley, who was infamous, um, early pioneer and ran the state aer aeronautics um, administration for a long time and wrote, literally wrote the book on early Montana flights. Um, Frank Wiley is an important person and he said, I well remember the National Parks boys air mailing with their own money telephone books stolen from their hotel rooms to help keep the poundage up in these economically precarious times of air mail subsidy. <laughs> so the subsidies they got for carrying air mail kept this in business, kept this operation in business. Um, so the Montana Lighted Airway was part of the final leg to be constructed. And all you pilots probably are rec recognize this chart, and I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see it a little bit better. Um, it didn't, they didn't really start planning and constructing it in between 1928 and about 1931. And the plan was to start with the Salt Lake to Great Falls Airway. That was the most important one likely because National Park Airways, that's the route they flew and now they had airmail, so the government was going to invest a little bit in it. Um, so they planned, surveyed, cleared, and installed all along this route, and they inc included Monida, down here. Here we are at the Monida on the Idaho border. 
Dell, Dylan, Twin Bridges, there was a landing field, um, or not at Twin Bridges, and there was a landing field also at what they called Piedmont, which is near Whitehall. Um, and plans and surveys were being made for facilities that would be built in Armstead, Boulder, Mitchell, and Cascade. And so here's a close-up. You can see a little bit better, and I enhanced it a little bit so you could see where the beacon sites were. Um, so here's Menida, which has a beacon on top of it. Pine Top, Lima, Dell has a circle around it because there was a landing field there. Um, and then up to Armstead, which had a beacon, and of course the airport in Dillon where you could also land. Uh, this is a circa 1935 map, so this was farther along in the process than what I had been talking about just earlier. Let's see, but the majority of Montana's beacons um, date to the late 1930s, 1938, or even the post-World War II era, um, and when commercial flying and airmail in Montana had increased. The system reached its zenith across the nation in 1941. And according to Tom Johnson, who has done a ridiculous amount of research on beacons nationwide, um, there were, by 1945, how many? 84 beacons across the state, 70 between airports and 14 at airports. Not all of these were necessarily that same big style. Um, same, some might have just been flashers. I wasn't clear with his research whether he was counting the flashers or the whole tall beacons, um, but they mat marked courses all across the state. It's incredible, I mean, across the country, how many of these beacons and where they were. They're just impossible. I, you know, I am not young and in shape and bounding up mountains anymore. Um, in fact, I was thinking about climbing up to the university mountain one in Missoula for when I was over there for Easter. And I looked at it and thought, no, I, I'm not going to climb all the way up there. <laughs> but to get all of this heavy equipment up these hills, I mean, this one is from New Mexico, and it shows a burrow helping carrying up um, these huge uh, mirrors and, and bulbs up the mountain. So you can imagine how difficult it was to get to these very remote places. And Mike, did Mike come in? Mike Rogan wasn't sure if he was going to make it. He maintains the beacons, and I'll talk to him about him in a little while. He still climbs up all these wonderful hills through treacherous land. Okay, so here's a map. This, actually, this map actually dates to 1965. Um, and these are just the beacons that the FAA, the Federal Aviation Aeronautics, Avi whatever FAA stands for, help me out. Administration. <laughs> Administration, that's the word I couldn't think of. Um, so these are the FAA airway beacons um, in 1965. So they're all around. And they're divided into a couple groups, and I'll tell you why. Um, the lighted airways were constructed in every conceivable type of terrain. Um, and it laid the groundwork for the modern federal airway system. And just a little quote to say how important it was. Of all American contributions to, this to the technique of air, air transport operations, flying by night by beacons was the greatest. How great it was and how far it put the United States ahead of the rest of the world was attested to by the fact, as late as the 1930s, when Americans were flying more or less routinely at night, Europeans were still fingering at the hem of the idea of night flying. And it flourished nationwide until the mid-1960s. And during that decade, navigational technology advanced so quickly that many pilots thought the beacon system was becoming antiquated. The Federal Aviation Administration, in cost-cutting efforts, began to pare down the system by decommissioning many of the beacons, especially in parks of the country where the FAA would be unchallenged. Of course, that wouldn't be in the mountain states, or particularly in Montana, uh, where we really need them. Um, so the mountain states were really the ones who fought it hard. And in Montana's case, the responsibility of the system maintenance was transferred to a state level. So in 1965, the FAA began reviewing Montana's lighted airways as part of their move to eliminate these navigational aids. Um, and by 1972, nearly all of the lighted beacons in the U.S. were discontinued. 39 remaining FAA beacon lights in Montana were divided into two groups during the 1965 review. One group was considered to have little or no value at their current locations, 
and could be relocated to local airports for better usage. And they're the ones with the triangles. So you see Edge Hill, Huntley, Bull Mountain, Broadview. Um, so the second group was considered useful for pilots flying visual flight rules at night. And the FAA surveyed pilots and aviation organizations in Montana, but they received very few replies. Another nationwide study was also completed in 1965, and as a result, the FAA decided to retain only eight beacons uh, in Montana and decommissioned the rest by August of that year. And I have a list of all of these beacons if you're interested, but I won't read them all 39. Okay, so in addition to the FAA beacons, we also had community-owned beacons across the state. There were 52 airport beacons and 39 airway beacons. Um, and they're mostly community-owned. There's one military one, and that's up at the Glasgow Air Force Base. So they continued to work on their decommissioning idea, and they looked to see which beacons could be transferred to communities for local ownership and use. And this is a map of a few of the identified sites in 1965. Several were relocated to airports, including Stanford, Sealy Lake, Lincoln, Townsend, Laurel, and Plentywood, to name a few. But these are all ideas about where we could move things. And these are the eight that the FAA decided were important enough that they would pay for their upkeep and maintenance. They were Bozeman and Bozeman Pass, Homestake Pass near Butte, McDonald Pass, of course, Montana City, Sherman Gulch, Silver Bow, and University Mountain. So Sherman Gulch is right on the other side of Missoula. Um, Montana City, of course, and McDonald Pass. But they were going to let the rest of these go out. But of course, we wouldn't stand for that. And in January of 1966, Charles Lynch, the director of the Montana Aeronautics Commission, initiated the Montana Beacon System. The aeronautics boards collected 12 beacons for continuous operation along Montana's airways. And they're in green. And they were Boulder Pass, Whitetail Creek, Spokane Hill, Strawberry Butte, Canyon Resort, which is down towards Monida, uh, Stony Point, which of course we all know is the Reberg Beacon right here north of Helena, Wolf Creek, Hardy, which is still maintained, Avon, which is still there, Bonita, Alberton, and Saltice. So kind of following those main airway systems uh, from Salt Lake to Great Falls, from Seattle to Spokane and Spokane on west, and Helena to Twin Cities. So kind of bisected the quadrant, quadranted the um, southwest part of the state, where all the mountains are, most of the mountains. The FAA's ultimate goal, of course, was to completely phase out all of these beacons. Um, and by 69, they conducted another evaluation of the proposal to discontinue the other eight that there were remaining in Montana. And they claimed that the continued operation and maintenance of these beacons did not appear to provide a public service commensurate with the costs involved. Um, as a result of their survey, they received over 200 objections to discontinued beacon service. Um, Montana pilots wrote in and said, absolutely not. And the heavy response indicated a high degree of interest in use in the Beacon system. Therefore, by directive by Elsie Morris, Jr., Chief of FAA uh, Air Traffic, the Beacons once again avoided the acts. But by 1979, the FAA had completely bowed out. And the Montana Aeronautics Commission controlled all 21 of those Beacons, plus four additional relocated Beacons at West Yellowstone, Dell, Townsend, and Lincoln. The startup dates on this map, which are, I know are very hard to read, they're hard to read in the original, um, aren't when they first were lit, but when the Montana Aeronautics Commission took over. In 1984, um, Boulder Pass Beacon was decommissioned. Bonneville Power Administration uh, requisitioned the area for construction of a large overhead power line, which was to pass directly through the draw of the canyon, perpendicular to the highway and well above the beacon. Uh, with the overhead wires, er, 
were erected, it was determined that the beacon might become more of a hazard than a help. So it was decommissioned with the agreement that the overhead wires would bear a three-foot diameter white marking balls and flashing strobe lights so you can see them. And of course, you can see that those wires and those uh, flashers uh, as you're driving over the hill today. Um, so that one went out. And then budget cuts again threatened the beacon system in 1986, but this was in Montana. The Montana Pilots Association commissioned a survey and a report that convinced the state to keep them in use. But the reprieve was short-lived. And in 1991, the Department of Transportation Director John Rothwell ordered that the beacons be shut off. And they were between November and December of 1991. They just flipped the lights. People were upset. Um, the response was absolutely overwhelming. Hundreds of letters poured in, not only to the Aeronautics Division, but to the governor's office, to the congressman's office, um, to John Rothwell's office. Um, and they really supported the beacon system. The unsolicited response to turn the system back on was so great that the Aeronautics Board feared legal repercussions, because really, how else do you get a politician to do anything but threaten a lawsuit? Um, and they inquired about their legal liability through the Attorney General's office. An action was taken in January of 1992 board meeting, whereby seven of the nine board members decided that the beacons really should be turned back on. On March 2nd, 1993, Bozeman Pass Beacon was decommissioned because the Montana Power Company had erected a 180-foot radio tower that really overshadowed it. Um, and it had a strobe light on it. So to avoid redundancy and confusion, the older, shorter beacon was turned off. Today, the Montana Department of Transportation Aeronautics Division maintains the beacon under the direction of Mike Rogan, who has been doing it for exactly 30 years. And it's actually, it was exactly 30 years on Tuesday. I went over to his office to collect some pictures from him. And um, we were talking, and he said, oh, I've been doing this for 30 years. Today. It was April 2nd, 1983, when he started this job. So he's been at it for a long time and knows more about these things than anybody else on the planet, I think. Um, so currently, they maintain 17 beacons. Three mark high terrain, um, Stony Point, north of Helena, Monida Pass, of course, at the Idaho border, and Silver Bow near Butte. The other 14 mark airways between Lookout Pass, Missoula, Helena, Great Falls, Bozeman, and Butte. And I'll bet you've seen them without realizing what they were. Most of you probably already did know what they were. Look for the towers with their distinguishing orange and white paint and two-foot dome lights. Each rotating beacon emits two million candle power flashing in regular sequences and red course lights to guide planes through steep terrain. There are also beacons at the following airports in Dell, Rygate, Lincoln, and Sealy. So the list of airway beacons currently maintained by the division um, includes between the Idaho border and Missoula and then on to Helena. Start with Lookout Pass, and maybe I should go back. Okay, we start at Lookout Pass, then there's St. Regis, which was not part of the originals that they came, but they managed to turn that, that back on shortly after 1979, which was a nice victory. Alberton, the University Mountain, Bonita, um, and I had to look and find Bonita on the map because I was searching for them as I, you know, I drive back and forth from Missoula a lot. And, kept looking and say, is that it? Is that it? And of course, I was looking on the wrong side of the highway for the Bonita Beacon. It's actually on the north side of the highway. For some reason, I thought it was south. Um, but it's right there near the interchange at uh, Rock Creek. And the Avon Beacon, of course, um, and McDonald Pass. Then from the Idaho border south up north to Helena and then to Great Falls, we have Menida Pass, Canyon Resort, Homestake, Silver Bow, Whitetail, Stony, which is the Reberg be Beacon, uh, Wolf Creek, and Hardy. And Mike tells a story about they have to maintain these in all kinds of weather, and they have to go up and do it. And he said the only time he ever turned around and climbed back down the ladder was when he was climbing the Hardy Beacon, and the wind was blowing about 40 miles an hour. And he got about 30 feet up, and his um, hat kept blowing off. So he took his hat off and shoved it in his coat, and then um, he got about 10 more feet up and his glasses started blowing off. 
And he realized this probably is not the best idea. And he said in 30 years, it's the only time he turned around and climbed back down and didn't get back up to the top. So pretty treacherous. Um, and then from Helena uh, to Bozeman, then on to the Twin Cities, there are only two beacons left that are flashing, and they're at Spokane Hill near Winston and Strawberry here towards Bozeman. Okay, so Mike and five others in the aeronautics division check each beacon every three months. Um, they climb the towers and clean up all the old grease from the drive gears, grease the main bearings, clean the slip rings, oil the rocker switches, and check on the condition of all the old wiring. The lamps are marked for month and year installed, and they are changed on a need basis or after one year, whichever comes first. There they are, climbing to the top. Yes, they do this in winter too. This picture is from Lookout Pass, um, where as you can imagine, the snow gets very deep. It's pretty deep and icy. They have uh, big uh, crowbars that they use and they knock the ice and the snow off the ladders before they climb up. Um, but the generator house at Lookout Pass is great. Because it's not one of your standard ones. It's brick. I imagine it is brick because they tried those little metal sheds and they collapsed under the snow pack. Um, so we have this beautiful brick generator house at the top of, and storage facility at the top of Lookout Pass. And do you notice something unusual about this little house? In the summer, you use this door. <laughs> In the winter, you use the top door. Because <laughs> the only way to get in. Um, the other towers no longer needed their generator sheds and were easy to take down um, when, once they were connected to power lines. The beacon at Strawberry first ran on white gas like the others, then propane, and then a Marvel Oil commercial power through 1986. The generator there still stands if you can get up there. Um, here you see the foundation and equipment shed at McDonald Pass, um, and you can see remnants of beacon shacks and foundations from the air if you fly over them um, at Spokane, Stony, Homestake, Strawberry, Mac McDonald Pass, of course, and at Avon. So as I said, I first learned of these beacons at the Montana Pilots Association, um, and Mr. Vetter stopped by and grabbed me, and he goes, have you ever gone to Custer? I said, well, not often, you know, I've driven past it on the highway, and he gave me an excuse to get off the highway in Custer, which I love an excuse to get off the highway and go and explore something. Um, and he said, look, I think there's a generator shed out there. And there is, I found it. It's just sitting there in front of somebody's house. Um, and I checked the 1945 aeronautical chart, and sure enough, here we are at Custer. And there was a little landing field there and a beacon. I can tell the circle and the star um, right, right on the map. You get off at Custer and drive south maybe a quarter of a mile just past the bar. Um, and there it stands. Of course, they're on private property. And remember, these are on private property. If you want to go and visit any of them, they're usually leased from private owners who get very angry with you if you tromp across their land without permission. So I would just encourage you to be friendly and talk to people before you go tromping around. So I didn't tromp around on this guy's uh, property because there were no cars there and there was nobody home. I couldn't see that there was any remnant of the arrow or the base of the um, beacon at this particular one and was tempted to go into the bar at Custer and ask whose place it was, but I was in a hurry. It's usually my, and I was driving a state car and they kind of frown on it when I'm in a state car and stop at the bar and talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't do it that is time. That, is that lettering on the book? Yes. So, can you make it out? <laughs> Helena to TC, Helena to Twin Cities, right? Um, and I'll have to look. I didn't notice a number on the other side, but I'll have to like zoom in. I was at a pretty far distance. This is pretty um, brought up. So, yes. So, this was part of the Helena to Twin Cities airway. And there was also an airway that came up from Cheyenne and went to Billings as well. So there's a, a few beacons with that code on it as well. 
Um, so that's fun, but I think that this is in its original place. I don't think that this is one of the decommissioned ones that was moved. Don't I have a fun job? I get to go and look at this stuff. It's pretty great. Um, so that was fun. There's the one at Avon. So since then, if you'll excuse the pun, I've been on the lookout. Every time something orange and white comes into view during a road trip, I drive my children and husband crazy by saying, is that a beacon? We need to go over there and take a look. Um, and my husband actually has gotten into it, which is nice. Unfortunately, he's usually driving. And architectural historians are the worst drivers because we're always looking over here instead of the road. So I'm like, just keep your eyes on the road. I'll try and find him. So, but you can see he's the one who spotted this one for me the first time. Because again, I was looking on the wrong side of the highway. I was thinking it would be on the Missoula side of the highway as you're driving down uh, Highway 12. Um, but in fact, it's on the left side, on the east side of the highway. If you look up in a little swale, you can see it. Um, so next time in Missoula, I will climb to the top of University Mountain. I'm getting myself in shape. I'm going up and down the, our own mountain to get myself ready to go there. Um, and if you go, of course, the easiest one to access is the one here up at McDonald Pass. Um, now that it's a bit warmer out, you all can go out and explore a little bit um, and walk around a little bit. It's really great fun. Um, there's no fence around it, which is actually kind of terrifying. Um, but I was told by Mike that if I attempted to climb the ladder, that in fact I would be disappointed once I got to the top because they had to latch it and bolt it with a lock closed because kids were climbing up there and drinking beer and throwing bottles and stuff at the top of the path. So you can't get up to the top of the tower anymore. Um, but don't try and climb the ladder. I wouldn't try and climb this ladder anyway. <laughs> it just seems awful. And Mike was saying, now they have this, it's a metal wire um, that goes all the way up. And he said he was really disappointed around 1986 when they made them start wearing harnesses when they were climbing these things. He preferred it without, but he acquiesces and does it now. 